Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar, Office 365 versus G Suite. A couple of housekeeping items. First, feel free to submit questions through the Q&A tab anytime throughout. We will answer them either during or after the presentation. The slides and a recording of this webinar will be available later. And uh, feel free to come to our website for additional reports, updates, and attack briefs. My name is Michael Landway. I'm co-founder of Avanon, and we'll spend our day with uh, Yoav Nathaniel, who is our lead security analyst and white hat hacker. He's in charge of our forensic research and vulnerability analysis, but most importantly, he is our liaison between customers and engineering. Hey everyone, thank you for joining. So in today's discussion, we'll do a brief introduction and overview, but we're gonna compare the features, catch rates, and the enforcement options between Office 365 and G Suite, especially comparing them in um, when it comes to the abilities for the enterprise customer. Hopefully you'll be able to come to your own conclusions, but uh, we will offer our own at the end of the webinar. So let's start with security features. Um, so uh, we wanted to get an overview feeling of uh, an, overall, an overall feeling of uh, what kind of technologies are uh, come with uh, the different platforms, Office 365 versus G Suite. Uh, so we inspected, uh, we started with anti-malware, anti-phishing, anti-spam, uh, secure authentication. Uh, in addition to your ability to customize um, your uh, environment uh, in a way that makes sense to you, uh, if you need to add uh, additional um, uh, disclaimers or if you need to uh, quarantine specific uh, types of phishing. Uh, in addition to reporting and logging, uh, if you're trying to troubleshoot an issue uh, that might come up. So essentially from a high level, when comparing the two from an enterprise customer, there's really only the uh, URL rewriting as a, as a feature difference when it comes to uh, the two options. Uh, we extended this uh, by focusing on enterprise uh, security configurations uh, just based off of what we see uh, of our customer needs and overall in the market. Um, <clears throat> uh, both Office 365 and G Suite um, uh, allow you to configure your mail flow. Uh, Office 365 actually calls it mail flow rules or transport rules um, where you can actually prioritize um, uh, your different rules so you know exactly when everything is getting executed uh, as opposed to G Suite which have uh, which comes with content compliance rules uh, that run in parallel so it makes it slightly more confusing you have to be slightly more careful with how you manage those but overall they can achieve uh, more or less the same um, the same capabilities um, we also took note that, uh, especially in the, high, in the enterprise world, uh, you see that almost all enterprises nowadays are hybrid. Um, and uh, with Google, it doesn't come built in. Uh, rather, you need to play around with the content compliance rules to really make it work, as opposed to Office 365, which comes with uh, hybrid, allows you to create hybrid connectors. Um, and those connectors are actually very, very similar to the connectors you get on your on-prem exchange. So it's the Microsoft talking to Microsoft kind of thing. Um, both of them allow you to disable POP and IMAP if you don't want your users to use a custom uh, mail client. Uh, message encryption, um, the big difference between Azure RMS and uh, uh, SMIME uh, enhanced encryption is that Azure RMS um, is a click of a button and uh, if you use the default configurations uh, you essentially let Microsoft host the key the encryption key so uh, essentially Microsoft does potentially have access to that email so it's not end-to-end -end encryption but it comes uh, equipped it, it integrates directly right into their security capabilities so they can still scan the email even though it came in encrypted um, both solutions offer message archiving. Uh, in Google, you can actually check a box to enable uh, OCR, image text, image, image text extraction. 
uh, if you're trying to make uh, content compliance rules uh, in regards to DLP, uh, data leakage, uh, or cer certain compliances. Um, uh, you have uh, extended file sharing uh, external access control, so you can uh, limit your users to not share uh, uh, via link or not share with users outside the organizations or only share with specific domains. Um, and then e-discovery and DLP um, come in different forms, but um, those are advanced capabilities that both of them offer, usually for a more of a premium license. Next, we wanted to focus about uh, basic authentication, um, MFA, um, multi-factor authentication, everybody uses it or should use it. Uh, in Google, you get slightly more options. Uh, it works really nicely with the Authenticator app, which is provided by Google. They also have the backup codes uh, so that you can uh, print a sheet of paper. And let's say you're traveling to Colombia, you lost your phone, and uh, now you need to access your Google account. Um, but you don't have that second uh, factor, you can use your backup codes to access your Google account. Um, so that comes in handy, but there's also a potential security risk, right? Uh, application passwords, um, in case anybody is not familiar with application passwords, um, those are secondary passwords that can be essentially created by any user in your organization um, and uh, bypass MFA. So you typically use those passwords for uh, the older uh, clients, uh, like Pop and IMAP, uh, and you usually enter just once. So um, it will uh, be recorded in the client, and, um, and that's how it will access. Uh, it's not necessarily recommended, but uh, sometimes it's required. Um, the good news is that both solutions allow you to, uh, as the admin, to delete application passwords for all of your users, or some, depending on which users you want to delete. Um, password expiration, both of them allow you to uh, have passwords automatically expire. And the cool part about Office 365 is that it's enabled by default. Um, so assuming you don't touch the configurations at all, um, uh, within two years all of your users' passwords will expire and it will force them to change it. Uh, even though we recommend configuring this to about every few weeks, every few months, every organization is different. So from a high level, the, probably the greatest difference between the two is that Google offers a number of different authentication offer, offerings so that it makes it easier for your users, more convenient for your users to be secure. And this is actually my favorite part uh, of the webinar because uh, I think that uh, advanced authentication uh, is actually the future. Um, the biggest threat to cloud environments is uh, breaches, right? You're getting, uh, you're getting uh, phishing emails, uh, hackers are uh, stealing your users' passwords, credential harvesting, and so uh, you need to make sure that you can lock that down. This is your cloud network, or what I like to call context, and so uh, Office 365 came out uh, last year, or even a year before that, with uh, a feature called conditional access, and uh, Google just very recently came out with a beta. It's very new. I'm sure that 99% of the people here are even aware of it, uh, is uh, context-aware access where uh, you can essentially limit access to, um, to your cloud environment. And so um, the good news about conditional access is that it's slightly more baked, right? Because you can uh, limit uh, you can limit it based on more options. Your controls are more granular. Uh, so, for example, uh, Google will create, allow you to create certain conditions um, uh, that will uh, become relevant to a specific application. So you can use Google Drive if you come from this VPN network, right? Something like that. As opposed to Microsoft, uh, which allows you to get more granular here. Um, and uh, they can say you can use an Office 365 session from anywhere in the US, right? So you can log in to your uh, Office 365 from anywhere in the United States, but you can only uh, authorize a third party application from the VPN network, right? So, um, so those types of controls and functionalities uh, really make the difference, uh, but overall, um, I do expect Google to come out with a whole lot new capabilities. Um, 
and uh, more configurations and more controls uh, in a way that uh, will really make it a competitive solution. Uh, we also wanted to touch upon uh, the third-party application marketplace uh, because uh, this uh, attack vector is on the rise. Uh, we started seeing it about three years ago, I want to say, uh, with the Google Docs. That was the biggest uh, widespread uh, third-party attack. Um, so we have uh, two sides of the coin here. On one hand, in Office 365, uh, with the Adalom acquisition, you have what's called the Cloud App Security um, Portal, which allows you to um, gain intelligence and receive alerts automatically about um, different applications that your users might be using. So for example, you can get an alert if your user is suddenly authorized uh, a bad application, or if 100 users uh, downloaded or installed the same application uh, in a very short amount of time. Uh, while Google doesn't have uh, such intelligence tools for you, um, they do come, they do provide uh, an application vetting process, a very thorough one. Uh, we know this firsthand because we integrate with Google. Um, um, I'm not too fond of the process, but uh, we deal with it. Um, uh, where essentially they if you're a Google, if you're a developer and you go on Google and you're trying to create a third-party app, um, you can install it on your own environment. But in order for you to distribute, you need to explain to Google what it does. Uh, they need to uh, test it and so forth. So, when comparing Office 65 and Google, a lot of enterprise try to make a decision from a business level rather than from a technical level looking at terms of service, looking at compliance. And so what we'd like to do is try to eliminate that as a decision-making path because first, when it comes to security, neither organization it will include security in their terms of service. According to the shared responsibility model, neither Office 65 or Google are responsible for the additional layers of, of security that, that they add their best effort SLAs, they will catch malware, but only known malware. And then in their terms of service, there's really no SLA for things that they miss. When it comes to compliance, there's an, another parity between the two. Whether you are in the financial industry, healthcare industry, education, you probably fall under some level of compliance protocol. There used to be a disparity, uh, just a few years ago, but now both meet the requirements necessary for all the major compliance regulations. Now, in some cases, you may need to activate or deactivate services or sign up for a particular level of service, but in short, this is not a decision-making criteria. You can make either platform compliant with any major regulation. Cool. So we also uh, did some testing to just measure up catch rates. Um, so we essentially uh, talked to our partners um, who are all over uh, the anti-malware industry. Um, and uh, we took about 100 uh, zero-day files that were detected from the wild. Uh, we took 100 files per day and to see how they plug into both uh, email and file sharing systems in Office 365 and G Suite. Um, the way we conducted the test, uh, so we sent uh, an email with an attachment uh, and waited 20 minutes uh, for the results. Uh, we did that 100 times per day. Um, and, um, and so if the attachment was in the inbox, if the email was in the inbox and the attachment was available and you could download it onto your desktop, that's considered uh, as, a, as a breach, right? Because the malware got through. Uh, for file shares, um, we, uh, we, up, we uploaded a piece of malware to Google Drive and OneDrive, uh, and uh, within 20 minutes, uh, we checked in again and to see if you can download it, if you can share it, if it was detected, right? And uh, we then we even performed a second check two hours later, just because of the different uh, way that it works. One common, one really important thing to consider is that. Um, Email systems and file sharing systems don't behave the same way um, because email is very fast, it's very real time, 
and uh, it's already built in that it's going, going to block very specific uh, MIME types like executables, for example. You don't receive an executable as an email attachment because it's blocked. But for file sharing, you can, you're more than welcome to upload an executable to Google Drive. Um, in addition, um, in the file sharing space, uh, a lot of the scanning is asynchronous. So it happens in the background. It might take slightly longer as opposed to uh, in the email world, um, most of it, not all of it, but most of the scanning is done uh, before the recipient even gets the email. Um, so catch rates for email. Um, we saw that uh, Google uh, outperformed with 99.2% uh, uh, catch rate, um, uh, as opposed to uh, EOP, which is the default Office 365 email security. It comes built in, um, which caught 92.3%. Uh, and if you have the uh, additional ATP capability, um, it will catch actually 94.8%. So you have a 2.5% uh, add-on to that. Yeah, so when it comes to the user experience in either of these cases, the, when it comes to the difference between a, the EOP or advanced threat protection, you'll notice that there is a small benefit when it comes to catch rate, but probably the most important difference is the delay caused by the sandboxing. Looking at file sharing, uh, Google also uh, displayed the best results uh, with 93.6% uh, uh, of malware that was caught. Um, again, because you have those static layers uh, that prevent, let's say, executables in emails, um, that's just an example. Uh, you do see a big discrepancy between uh, email and file sharing results. Um, for Office 365, we saw that uh, EOP was able to, or not EOP, but the default anti-malware, was able to catch 66.3%. Uh, now, when we uh, plugged in the same malware to uh, an Office 365 uh, environment with ATP enabled, uh, we saw that within 20 minutes, it was able to catch the same, uh, uh, the same as the default security. But if you waited two hours additionally, uh, an additional two hours, it actually came up to 74.6%. So, you notice the different catch rates, but I think probably the most important thing is what these systems do when it comes to blocking access to the users. And so while they may catch it in 20 minutes or in two hours, the real question is whether the user has access to those files before the decision is made. So we looked at the different uh, security philosophies when it comes to email phishing. Um, the Microsoft approach uh, was uh, really power empowering the user, right? It wanted the user to make the decision. Um, and you see that in multiple ways, uh, one of which uh, is the junk folder. Um, they want more emails to go to the junk rather than be automatically quarantined, uh, because then the user still has visibility into any of those emails. Um, uh, and also when uh, they quarantine something, you can configure so that your users will receive um, uh, a report at the end of the day with um, all of their uh, all of their recent quarantines, and the user can re restore emails on his own. Um, so um, it, it's a double-sided coin, right? It's a double-edged sword because uh, on one hand uh, you have um, you have the users empowered, but on the other hand, they're also um, uh, you're putting too much responsibility into the user, and especially in the modern day when you talk about user training, user awareness, um, sometimes the users don't make the best decision. Uh, when it comes to Google, uh, and I think 